Goddess Kring Radio. Shannon Kringen. Goddess Kring. Shannon Kringen. Goddess Kring. Welcome to Shannon Kringen Podcast on Hollow Earth Radio. I'm Goddess Kring, Shannon Kringen, and it is now March 30th, 2017. This is my podcast number 24. I've been doing this every week for 24 weeks. Time has flown on by. This time, I made a list of all the topics that I wish to discuss. I'm going to talk about immigration and what I feel and think about that. Price gouging in medicine and how that's legal in the United States, apparently, but I'm not sure if it's really supposed to be legal. Democratic socialism mixed with capitalism and what that means to me. How I think 9-11 was a planned demo and why I think so many people refuse to acknowledge that perhaps that's the case because it's, you know, disturbing and denial is a powerful thing. How I think Donald Trump and all of his cabinet members and people who like his budget ideas are all economic terrorists as well as environmental terrorists. Bernie Sanders and Jimmy Carter and why I love those two men. Solar power travel, all the different traveling I've done, Mexico, Australia, various countries in Europe in the last 20 years or 21 years, a guy from India named Krishnamurti, who my mom raised me with part of the philosophy of, also the philosopher and visual artist Hunderwasser from Austria, uh, why I think fans of Trump are fans of his and why some people seem to respond well when someone is really mean and macho and a bully and never apologizes for anything. Some people feel safe and secure around such a personality. Not me, but some people do. And let's see. Now I can't really read my writing. Nutrition. I would also talk about nutrition, pet nutrition, human nutrition. So, oh, and how I survive in the cutthroat United States uh, system of capitalism. So welcome, Shannon Kring and Goddess Kring, podcast number 24. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you, Hollow Earth Radio, for having me. And I also, this is live on Hollow Earth Radio every Thursday from 3 to 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time in the USA. And I also permanently archive this on my YouTube Mixcloud, Bandcamp, and Patreon, all for free, free to the public, 24-7, and it's 60 minutes every week, and most of it is improvisational monologue that I make off off the top of my head, as well as some poetry and spoken word and tidbits of music that I've created that I throw in. So thank you for tuning in. I saw an article recently on how much the USA pays for insulin. If someone is diabetic, they need to inject themselves with insulin to keep their blood sugar at a good level to prevent themselves from going into a diabetic coma from having their blood sugar, I guess, get too high. And I kind of knew this was true. Generally speaking, I have friends in Norway and England, and I know that they don't get big medical bills and they just pay taxes. And in fact, both of my friends that live in England and Norway make a higher wage than I do proportionately for their standard of living. And they don't have medical bills because they have single payer socialized medical care in Norway and England. And I'm, I want to try to use more specific examples because sometimes when I talk about these topics, I'm very vague about it. So this is why I liked when I saw this article. It was published on insulinnation.com and recently and the title of the article is US pays much more than UK for insulin and it goes on to it's a very kind of a long article on their website a study finds that US consumers pay between 5.7 and 7.5 times more for Lantus and Norvo Rapid than UK consumers. And those are two kinds of insulin. I myself am not diabetic. And as far as I know, nobody in my family is diabetic. So I don't have 
personal experience with needing insulin, and I'm glad I don't after what I'm reading here. Basically, people with diabetes in the U.S. are paying five to seven times more than those in the U.K. for the same two popular insulins. And it's really sad to see this. And it's good to know that for, for, for real, we have price gouging in the United States of America in our medical healthcare industry. The fact that this article even calls cons- us consumers, we are United States citizens and we are called consumers of insulin. I don't think of myself as a consumer of medical treatment or medications. I personally am not on any kind of medication except for birth control pills, if you're going to call that medication. I do take birth control pills and I take vitamins and mineral supplements, but I'm not on any medications for any physical health issues or any psychiatric conditions. I do have a tendency towards mental health challenges like OCD, cyclothymia, borderline, post-traumatic stress, anxiety, and depression, and maybe ADHD, but I'm not taking any medications. But thankfully, I have Obamacare, affordable health care for low-income people, and right now my health care is mostly free. And I feel very lucky because I don't actually know anybody else that has the same kind of health care that I have. I'm on AppleCare, Medicaid, or Medicare in Washington State, Seattle, and I'm very, very amazed and happy with my health care right now. I don't know what the Trump people are going to do to my health care, but for now, I think I'm safe until the end of 2017, and then I'm not sure what happens after that. But I don't think of myself as a consumer. In fact, I think that's really unethical to call American citizens consumers when we talk about medical treatment. And even the concept of health insurance seems ridiculous to me. I don't really want health insurance. I want health care. What I would like to do is pay taxes. And I'm willing to even pay higher taxes, especially if the wealthy people also have to pay higher taxes and not get tax cuts. And the corporations. I would be fine if we abolished all health insurance companies in this country. My friend in England works for a company and his health care is federal with the UK government and it's the National Health System, NHS, and it's nonprofit as far as I know. And I don't think that they think of their citizens as customers. I'm not a consumer or a customer of medical products. I am a citizen in the United States who goes to a doctor as a patient not a consumer. You know, when I go to a shopping mall and buy clothing or televisions or cars or shoes or socks or underwear or shampoo or food, I guess then I'm a consumer. I'm a consumer of products that I buy and I'm okay with those companies making a profit. But when I go to the doctor, the dentist, the eye doctor, Uh, The physical doctor who takes blood pressure and blood samples and tells me I need surgery, I don't want to be thought of as a customer who is consuming for-profit products. So I think we need to change our mindset of thinking that healthcare is part of capitalism. I think it's so unethical to have medical treatment and healthcare be considered part of our capitalist system. Okay, back to my train of thought. I just got a phone call. Pardon that sound that you just heard. So healthcare as part of capitalism seems really unethical to me. Being a for-profit system, I'm not sure if they fully acknowledge that that's how it works, but yes, indeed, that's how it works. And my friend in England works for a company. He does graphic design. I'm not sure what the name of his company is or what their main focus is. But basically in the UK, in the United Kingdom, companies do not give their, their workers health insurance. They don't have to worry about that. That's all taken care of by the NHS, Socialized Medicine in England, by the government. And a small portion of my friend's paycheck every month, <coughs> excuse me, is put into his health care. And he can go to the doctor anytime he wants in any clinic around his area. 
and there's no bill. And that's considered normal in England. And if someone doesn't like the national health care system in England, they can get private insurance, which is separate from their job. So it's a private insurance company. And I have heard from people that live in the UK that it's not that expensive. So it's not like, you know, you have to pay like several hundred dollars a month just to have private health insurance in England. So it's more affordable and reasonable even to pay because the UK government does not allow price gouging. So they give them incentives to keep the costs down. So not that it's perfect utopia in these other countries, but definitely the United States, we are known for having the large prison for profit, many, 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 many inmates, and it's a profit-making business, the prison. Prison, war, and health care. Those are the things we're known for. Our healthcare system is one of the most expensive healthcare systems in the world. Some people say it's one of the best in the world, which I think is a big lie. There are a lot of good doctors and nurses in the United States. I'm sure there are. And we have really good cancer research, perhaps, and really a lot of money put into these things and fancy marble countertops and fancy hospitals that look like hotels as opposed to other countries that have more socialized medicine, which are nonprofit, which are not as fancy looking in terms of the hospitals, but they are more affordable to people and they give everyone care, rich, poor, young, old, healthy, and sick. So it's a nonprofit public service. In the United States, we seem to think of healthcare as an industry, as a consumer, and we are customers and consumers of a for-profit industry. And I find that very offensive, and it doesn't make any sense to me. So I think I think more like a European. So I visited my friend in Norway and England and asked them questions about their healthcare system. And just price gouging is so offensive to me. And the article I read about how insulin in England is five to seven times cheaper than it is in the United States for the exact same kind of insulin is really, really, really upsetting to me. And that's just one example. There are also examples of, of like how an aspirin could cost $10 in a hospital. Or my friend, I met somebody who used to live in England and tetracycline is an antibiotic. And he said in England, it was about 75 cents per pill. And in the United States, it was $12 and 50 cents for the exact same pill. So you do the math on that, Seven, 75 cents versus 12.50. I would say that's a good 500 to 1000 percent higher in the United States. Same thing with dental. You know, my dad flies to Costa Rica to get dental work that's 400% cheaper. Something that would cost for airfare, hotel, and dental $5,000 in Costa Rica, as opposed to the United States, $20,000 for just the dental treatment and no hotel and no airfare. So there's an example of dental in this country. Although I know in Norway, dental is expensive and dental is not a very socialized thing in Norway. And I don't know why in Norway they give their citizens really good socialized health care in most other ways, but apparently not with dental treatment. So that's very strange. And my friend says a lot of Norwegians fly to other countries like the Czech Republic or Poland to get their teeth worked on because it's a lot less expensive there. And you can get really good dental care in the Czech Republic for a lot less than other countries. So I wanted to also talk about how I think Trump and the Trump people and the cabinet and the way that they are cutting the budgets of Meals on Wheels and socialized things that help older people and yet they're beefing up the military budget and they're, they're cutting budgets for veterans and yet beefing up the war budget and the military defense budget. And it's sad to me that the United States military has so many bases all over the world, and yet we're cutting funds to help our veterans. Now, that's a real slap in the face to a veteran, isn't it? If I was a veteran, I'd be really angry. 
But who are we to think that we are the police of the world? And who are, who are, who's the United States to think that we should boss other people around? And why is it that we think we're the good guy? Sometimes we're not the good guy. Sometimes war is terrorism and terrorism is war. And it's pretty much all the same, except one is legal. You know, the bumper sticker that says war is terrorism, I agree with. War is legal terrorism. Terrorism is illegal war. It's all just a bunch of war and violence. And one person is the us versus them, which leads me to want to talk about Krishnamurti. Krishnamurti is a guy from India who passed away and lived to almost 100, I think. I think he died in the 80s. My mom sort of raised me on some of his ideas of questioning everything, questioning reality, questioning the way humans follow traditions and the way we separate ourselves of nationalities and races and religions, and even species, I would say speciesism. You know, who are humans to think that we are so separate and superior to other animals, which leads me to, to talk about something else, which is factory farming. Factory farming, I am not a vegetarian right now, but I've been a vegetarian off and on since I was 15, mostly because of how they treat the animals. The way we treat animals like they're machines working for us. It's like animals, cows and chickens and pigs and all the different animals that we slaughter and consume. It's like they're slaves for humans. And it's really sad to me. We're full, pumped full of hormones and antibiotics. And it's just so artificial. And I recently watched a video of Temple Grandin showing how they slaughter cows and how she invented a way that's a bit more peaceful and humane in terms of the cows calmly walking and not knowing what's going to happen next, which is that they get shot in the head and then they die. But when I saw the video, I was amazed at how calm she was talking about how to make it better and more humane and more ethical, because if we're going to continue to slaughter animals, which we probably will, we may as well do it in the most humane way possible to, to as not cause as much stress and trauma to the animal, kill them quickly and efficiently, and then get the meat, you know, chop up the meat, whatever you're going to do. I know that I would be a vegetarian if I had to hunt my own animals. Unless I was starving to death, then I guess I would hunt my own animals. Part of one of my poems is about being, having empathy for the predator, sympathy for the deviator. So I am kind of a paleo person. I have a tendency to eat lots of fruits and vegetables and beans and nuts, and I drink a lot of water. I drink coffee, tea, and water, and sometimes kombucha, and I make fruit smoothies with hemp protein powder. I have a tendency to not buy cheese. I buy eggs, but I don't buy milk or cheese from the dairy industry. I occasionally have ice cream. I feed my cat raw meat, frozen uh, meat food from the health food pet store, and he continues to thrive. For a little while, the vet thought my cat might be diabetic, but it turns out he's not, and he continues to thrive. I feed him venison, pork, beef, lamb, chicken, turkey, bison, chicken hearts, freeze-dried, frozen raw meat, various different kinds, several different kinds to try to get as much variety in his diet as possible. And I have fresh water for him, but he, he seems to rarely actually drink the plain water. He tends to just get most of his liquid from his food. So I will say that if you are, if you have a cat or dog that has health problems, or if they're healthy and you want to improve their health and do preventative care for them, to help them live the longest, healthiest life possible, I would suggest looking up Dr. Karen Becker online. She has a YouTube videos on how to feed your cat or dog raw food in the safe way. And I know I've said this before. Um, my cat is really doing well. His digestive system, his fur, everything. And I actually stopped eating wheat over three years ago, all gluten and all wheat, and I don't eat much rice. I don't really eat too many grains. I eat potatoes, fruits, vegetables, beans, nuts, seeds, some meat, not a lot of dairy, and no grains. Occasionally I eat oats and quinoa and amaranth flakes, what do you call them, and flax, hemp, and chia seed. 
When I make oatmeal, I get a special kind of oatmeal that has no gluten, guaranteed no wheat products accidentally mixed into it. And it has quinoa and amaranth. And I put chia, hemp, and flax seed on it. And I put fresh frozen blueberries. And I, I have a smoothie with acai fruit and protein powder that's raw hemp. And it has a really good balance of amino acids. I also take an herb called ashwagandha. And I drink mineral water from an artesian well near Seattle, which I feel very, very lucky and happy and grateful that I am living in an area that has clean, free water. I feel so sad for people who live in places without clean water. And the way I survive in the United States of America is I only make about $1,500 a month and I recently got a Section 8 voucher, which means my rent is only about a third of my income. And then I prove this by showing them my income tax. And I basically work really hard, but I'm low income. And so I thought about trying to make a lot more money and then paying off. I owe $67,000 for my bachelor's degree from Antioch University in Seattle. And they've been paid off by the Fed loan people, but now I still owe a for-profit corporation of student loans $67,000, and the interest is just going to keep climbing. So my parents and I are trying to figure out if when they pass away and if I inherit anything from my parents, are the student loan people going to take that away from me? So we're trying to find a way to protect me legally. I don't know what I'm going to inherit. My parents are divorced and they're not wealthy. Uh, but they're planning on trying to give me something when they pass away, and I'm an only child. So we're trying to figure that out. But basically, I was going to say that my way of surviving in Cutthroat Capitalist USA is I have affordable rent, and I'm so grateful because many people in Seattle do not have affordable rent. Most of their income goes to rent, or they have to have a bunch of roommates. I'm in a position where I have rent that's only a third of my income, and that eases my stress. And I work full-time as a figure model for art classes all over the city, north, south, east, and west. I model on Vashon Island, Bainbridge Island, Whidbey Island, Tacoma, Shoreline, Everett, Seattle, all over the place. Um, west Seattle, Kirkland, Renton, Redmond, Bellevue, you name it. I model all over the place. I also deliver groceries part-time off and on. That's a very stressful job. I'm learning as I go. I kind of like it because I get to go and zip around in my tiny little car and work alone, solo. I like to kind of do things on my own. Hence, I'm doing this solo podcast. If you're just tuning in, my name is Shannon Kringen. You're listening to Goddess Kring podcast number 24 on Hollow Earth Radio. And it's also archived on YouTube, Bandcamp, Patreon, and Mixcloud. And it's all free every week, 60 minutes. So my way of surviving in the United States is funny that I'm actually better off, I think, being low income. If I tried to be middle class, if I could become wealthy, I guess I'd be okay. I'm thinking I need to make at least six, seven, eight, ten thousand dollars $10,000 a month then I could pay off my student loans, but then I would have to pay market rate for rent. And in Seattle for a one bedroom apartment, market rate is probably 15, 1600 a month. I have no idea. So my rent would be really, really, really high. So if I made about $10,000 a month, maybe I'd be okay. And then my health care, see the cost of my health care would go way up. The cost of my student loans would go way up and the cost of my rent would go way up. So if I made more money than I do now, unless I made tons more, like literally 10, I make 1500 bucks a month right now. I'd say I'd probably have to make at least 6,000 a month or more in order to be able to afford healthcare, rent, student loans. So right now I'm on income-based repayment with the student loan people and my I qualify to pay zero right now because I'm so poor. I also have food stamps. I sometimes qualify for food stamps and I sometimes don't. I recently reapplied again thinking I wouldn't even get them and I did because I'm low income enough and I'm very, very grateful. I did that partly because the Section 8 Seattle Housing Authority told me that if I applied for food stamps and I got an account, I might qualify for a grant 
to go back to school for four quarters for free and then I would have to pay for the rest. So I'm thinking about going and learning more about web design or graphic design. I have a certificate in graphic design from many years ago, over 20 years ago after high school, I studied graphic design and got a certificate, but that was before computers took over. So I mostly learned graphic design with X-Acto knives and Rapidograph pens and illustration board and amber lith and ruby lith and doing things the old fashioned way, the way we used to have to do everything by hand and then have it printed on a printing press instead of it's all digital now on computers. So I could enhance my skills and qualify for funding for that perhaps, but I'm not really sure if that's gonna happen. So basically, that's kind of how I survive capitalism. I was gonna say that uh, democratic socialism is something that I love and admire and I wish that we had more of it. When I visit my friends in England and Norway, I'm struck by the beautiful train stations. I mean, you can tell if you visit Norway and England and you go to the large train stations in Liverpool and London and Oslo, you will see huge train stations that are beautifully, like there's public art and there's beautiful signage and there's a lot of people that have jobs that work in the train stations. And even in Edinburgh, Scotland, they have really good buses, like mass transit. They have trains, but they also have buses. And I was struck by how beautiful the buses are in Edinburgh, Scotland, and how there's lots of people working in the bus station and directing traffic. There's so many buses in Edinburgh, Scotland, that they have people in fluorescent vests that are out there directing the buses and directing the traffic to keep it all safe and running smoothly. So the socialized democracy system that they have in these European countries, I'm talking about Scotland, England, and Norway, I've been to all three of them and seen firsthand that the government and the taxes paid by the citizens all go into mass transit and healthcare. So the basically the mass transit and healthcare is more well funded in these European countries I've been to than they are here in the United States, generally speaking. So to me, democratic socialism would mean public services like healthcare and mass transit and public roads, public things that all citizens use, whether they're rich, poor, young or old, sick or healthy, like mass transit and healthcare and public roads and public education, public higher education like college and university, as well as high school and grade school and kindergarten, all of the public school that we use. People in Europe pay higher taxes than we do here in the United States, but all most of that money, as far as I can see, goes to the infrastructure of public services that everyone uses and society as a whole benefits. Cutthroat capitalism that we have here in the United States makes it so that rich people pay less taxes, poor people pay more taxes, and I don't know where some of that money goes. Our healthcare system is way, way, way more expensive. I think most of the money in America goes to prison and war and bailing out Wall Street. So basically, democratic socialism mixed with and helping to keep capitalism more ethical is the way that I would want to see this country go. The United States, if Bernie Sanders was the president, and I think it's pretty naive to think that he ever will be the president, unless the corruption can somehow be stopped, somebody like Bernie Sanders is a big threat to the military industrial complex. To the Wall Street bankers who run the USA, Bernie Sanders is a threat because Bernie Sanders as well as well as Robert Reich talk about income equality and how in the United States the middle class is disappearing and it's turning into a super wealthy versus super poor society crime rates are probably going to go up so i would say that democratic socialism if it's in place in terms of how we run our healthcare system 
and our mass transit and our public education and our public roads, if those things were democratic socialism and not part of capitalism, then capitalism would be healthier and more ethical. We could still have capitalism in terms of people owning their own businesses and making a profit and artists making a profit, people who want to run their own commercial business, pay your taxes, make a profit, etc. But basic things like mass transit, education, and health care should all be paid for with taxes and should be non-profit. See, communism is probably one more extreme further, which communism, I guess, takes away competition and makes everyone equal, and maybe everyone gets a low wage. I don't really understand ca communism exactly, but some people compare communism to democratic socialism. Socialism might be harsh, but democratic socialism is very different. Democratic socialism benefits all of society, rich and poor, young and old, sick and healthy. Democratic socialism would be that we can all vote on how we want the money spent in terms of mass transit. We could have so many more trains in the United States. We could fix the potholes and fix the water infrastructure. With democratic socialism, taxes would go up for the wealthy and perhaps down for the poor and the middle class. So especially with our health care system, we could expand Obamacare to give everybody single payer Medicaid, Medicare, nonprofit health care, eliminate the for profit health insurance companies, eliminate all of that and simplify and streamline it and have the government do what it's supposed to do if it's ethical, which would be to stop price gouging. And if it's true, I've heard that American drugs are more expensive for two reasons. One, because there's price gouging and our, our healthcare medical system is part of capitalism, which means a pharmaceutical company can decide to raise the price of something by a thousand percent just because they want more profit. Whereas in other countries, they don't allow that. I've heard that that's one of the reasons. That's the main reason. The second reason is that apparently the United States does more testing on these drugs and research and puts money into it. And then other countries, we pick up the slack for other countries that don't do that. But I'm not sure if that's actually true. So basically, if that's true, then that should be more equal and that other countries should have to help share the cost. So maybe we need more international diplomacy and relationships between countries to make it more diplomatic and make it more ethical and fair and maybe there should be more of a unified way of charging people for medical treatment. And, But I do believe that the United States would be a lot better and more ethical. Capitalism would be a lot healthier. There's nothing wrong with making a profit and being competitive and being an entrepreneur. But when, when capitalism is part of health care and public education, then you have a problem. Because then it becomes really greedy and corrupt and poor people can't afford it. And, and, you know, I've noticed that when I go to different countries in Europe, I'm struck by how not everybody is wealthy, for sure, but the overall lifestyle seems much better. People take more holidays. I know that my friend in England gets a lot more vacation time than I do. He works full time at a good company. And they have fundraisers and bake sales for charity. And they take several Monday bank holidays off. They give their employees paid sick leave and paid vacation, as well as unpaid extra vacation time or holiday time. And it's considered very normal in most of Europe to take holidays and vacations. And not just if you're wealthy and if you save up enough money and work hard, it's considered a normal part of life for everyone to take a vacation or a holiday, even if you're low income. And when there's no health care bills to worry about, that makes it easier to take a vacation so or a holiday to balance out your work life with your leisure life. And I've noticed even in England, they call health clubs leisure clubs. It's kind of a different attitude. It's kind of like it's considered a normal part of life 
to work and play and have leisure and enjoy your life and have more of a balance and less competition and stress. I've noticed that whenever I go to Europe, I can feel the better mass transit, but I can see the people that live in the, in the culture, they look less stressed out than Americans. There's, a less, there's less of a feeling of competition in other countries, and there's more of a feeling of cooperation. You know, healthcare is built into the system. It's socialized. The train system is amazing in England and Norway and Scotland. I've also been to Austria and Belgium and France and Italy and Spain. And I enjoyed going there. And all of these countries seem to have a lot better trains than what we have here in the United States. I've noticed amazing public art in a lot of public train stations. There's a certain like public decency and ethics that I've witnessed in other countries outside the U.S. Now, there's a lot of great people in the United States, don't get me wrong. The United States is a great country in many ways. But I will say that the way our money is spent, the way the federal budget is spent, it seems like most of the money gets hoarded and embezzled by the wealthy. And people brag about having low taxes. And it's like every man for himself competition, cutthroat competition, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, work really hard, and maybe you won't be poor. That's just such a different attitude than in the European countries I've been to, where they actually put money, they keep the healthcare costs low, and everybody pays into the nonprofit healthcare system. And then you can go to the doctor and not get a big bill. And it's not considered a fancy luxury to go to the doctor. And the mass transit is more heavily funded. And there's a lot more public art that I've seen in these other European countries than I've seen here in the United States. Even just pay phones. And, you know, in England, they have fancy pay phones that have Wi-Fi. In, in the United States, most pay phones have, have been destroyed, have been ripped away. We don't even have pay phones in the United States hardly at all. And when I went to England last time, about a year and a half ago, I noticed lots of pay phones. Everybody has a mobile phone as well. There's lots of mobile phones all over. But there's a lot of pay phones still in public places. And a lot of them have Wi-Fi. I don't even understand how it works, but apparently you can go into a pay phone in England and check your email. You know, if you don't have a computer, you can somehow use the Wi-Fi in this pay phone and use a card and pay. Very interesting. And when I bought train tickets in England, I was, I was thrilled with how easy it was to do it online with my mobile phone and or at a ticket machine in the train station and the bus station. So the mass transit in Europe is pretty amazing. And the United States would be a much better country if you want to make America great again, increase the mass transit, increase high-speed trains, solar power, uh, stop putting all the money into the military and give everyone nonprofit health care and nonprofit public education up through college and university like they do in a lot of other countries. So some of the way the budgets work in other countries is proof that democratic socialism actually works. And what that means is, is a more equal distribution of the wealth. The way the United States works is very competitive. There's poor people, middle class and wealthy and we're all competing with each other. And the rich people are probably afraid of losing their money and being poor. And the poor people are fantasizing and dreaming that they can become wealthy. And they're chasing after carrots. And it's just kind of sad. Like a little bit of that competition is fine. But if you have basic things like good mass transit, good public education, and good public health care, if you have all three of those in place in a society so that the rich, the poor, the young, the old, the sick, and the healthy all have basic, basic things like health care, education, and mass transit. Those are the three, health care, education, mass transit. Those three things in a democratic, socialistic society are well-funded. If all of our taxes went to support nonprofit health care, public education, and mass transit, and we all knew that we could get good mass transit, good education, and good health care. That takes away a lot of stress to poor people and to middle class and to wealthy. So give people basic things like that 
and then throw capitalism in on top of that. So if you get your basic needs met, health care, public transportation, and education, those things, everyone has an equal chance to do those if they want to work hard, take good care of themselves, go to the doctor, get yourself educated, and use the mass transit. Then if you want to be an entrepreneur and have your own business and make a profit and pay taxes on that, feel free. But your basic infrastructure is well funded. So I can see that whenever I go to Europe. I can feel it on how certain things are funded. Mass transit, education, and healthcare are more well funded than what we have here. In the United States, it seems like a lot of money gets hoarded by the wealthy and by the corporations who don't pay their taxes. So it's kind of like embezzling and money hoarding is okay and price gouging. Embezzling, money hoarding, and price gouging seems to thrive in a free market capitalist society. And that's just too much cutthroat for me. And then there's people who want less government. No, I don't want less government. I want more government. I want ethical government. I want democratic socialism type government. And then capitalism is the cherry on top. But the basic infrastructure should be about nonprofit. We all work so that we can enjoy our lives. We can have health care, mass transit, and education. And then on top of that, which is funded by taxes, and the government would regulate it and keep the costs low. The military budget would be shrunk, but the veterans would be well cared for. So those are some of my thoughts on democratic socialism and capitalism. Kali be gone, Kali be gone, Kali be gone. Tether no more, tether no more, more, more. Names that rhyme no longer on time. Drone of machine, comfort me to dream. Lands of sand, strand me solid. Solar twinkle, twinkle, sprinkle, 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 fertile, fertile, Gumby Gumby smiles, Gumby Gumby smiles, smiles, Gumby Gumby smiles. smiles. Eyes Eyes tired tired, but tingling tingling happy, happy. letting Letting subconscious subconscious guide guide the slide slide guitar guitar me. me. Twangy, spicy spicy twist of line. Green opal, green, blue. opal blue, rust, rust crackling rust off the mark, the mark, the mark. crispy rocks, crispy rocks. Mark, the mark the groove, groove. interlude, intertube, Gumby smiles, Gumby smiles, Gumby smiles. Okay, so that was one of my poems called Gumby Smiles. So thank you for listening. This is Shannon Kring and Goddess Kring. I think it's so cool that Jimmy Carter has leased 10 acres of his land and he's letting people build huge solar power plants to the point where it can power 200 homes in the area. So there's proof right there that solar power can really be powerful. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the whole Trump phenomena and how some people are fans of his, which I don't quite understand. You know how he sometimes, Donald Trump sometimes says that people are hired and paid to protest or to pretend certain things and that there's a bunch of fake news, etc. I have listened only for a couple minutes and then I have to turn it off to some of his supposed fans and I'm thinking maybe they're the ones that get paid to get on camera and say absurd things. I don't understand how these people can be real, but maybe they are. But I will say that there's a bully mentality. And I will say that I don't relate to it because I'm on the other end of the spectrum. I'm the opposite of a bully. 
Bullies are someone who never admit they're wrong, never admit they have a weakness, and they boss other people around, and they're pushy and bossy and mean. And they, they, I guess, feel powerful and confident when they do that. I'm somebody who actually, if anything, I say I'm sorry too much. Even when something isn't my fault, I tend to say I'm sorry. And I'm kind of too humble, and I have no ego. And I'm kind of like... Some people would say I'm wimpy, but to me, I'm kind and generous and humble. And I admit when I'm wrong or I'm willing to acknowledge if I make a mistake, but maybe sometimes I'm too much in that direction and I say I'm sorry and I'm trying to pick up the slack for other people and I let other people walk all over me, perhaps. So that leads me to want to just be alone and be as independent as I can. But I will say that I think there's a phenomenon, something about Donald Trump and the people that like him remind me of people in high school who picked on me. There's this certain like attitude that people have where they feel safe. Call him a cult leader if you want. Some people like it when somebody is really bossy and they act as if they can do no wrong. And then they criticize and blame other people and they point their fingers and make fun of and laugh at other people. I think some people find that comforting. They think that somebody is safe and they can trust that person if they're very strong and they never admit they're wrong about anything. I think that makes some people feel secure and safe and maybe it reminds them that they don't have to worry about their flaws. People don't want to think they even have flaws. They would rather just blame other people. And pretend like they're good and other people are bad. So I'm thinking that there's a sort of kind of mentality of people who like Donald Trump. They don't even care what he says or does. Even if what he says and does is awful and it harms them, they still seem to be going along with it. It's very strange. It's almost like he's hypnotized people and brainwashed people into th- into just being seduced by, it's going to be great. It's wonderful. The new Trump care is going to be wonderful. It's going to be great. Even though... It's actually going to enslave us even more and cut us out of the system. It's going to increase the profits for companies and decrease the health care that we receive. And yet some people just go along with it. It's just totally bizarre. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's all fake and nobody really likes him. I don't really understand. I am absolutely horrified by Donald Trump. I call him an economic terrorist. His budget ideas, he's increasing the budgets of the military and the defense and making it more possible for people to destroy the environment by deregulating environmental laws. And then he's decreasing Medicare, Medicaid, any help for low income and elderly people. He's doing exactly the opposite of what I would want. You know, Bernie Sanders would be increasing the budget for mass transit for helping elderly and poor people and veterans. And he would be decreasing the perks to Wall Street and decreasing, increasing the taxes basically for corporations. So basically, democratic socialism is what I believe in, and that's the Bernie Sanders style model of government, a more equal distribution of wealth. Whereas what Donald Trump is doing, I think that some of the people that wanted him in thought he was going to help them but it seems to be the opposite. He seems to be like Bush and Reagan on, you know, steroids, you know, turbocharged. Basically, Trump's budget ideas benefit the wealthy and nobody else. So it's kind of like business as usual, except a lot worse. I loved Obama in terms of him being black, in terms of him implementing the Obamacare affordable health care. But I wasn't happy with what Obama did with prison and war. Prison and war, I mean, he was no Martin Luther King. I wanted him to be more like Martin Luther King, more about democratic socialism, less war, less prison, more social infrastructure, more democratic socialism, more like what I said earlier, which is more funding and less profit for public education, public health care, and public transit. The key word in that is public. We all share it. It's a public service that all of us use, young, poor, rich, and old. So democratic socialism, 
with capitalism is a lot healthier than unregulated. A total free market in every way is not a good thing. Total freedom in every way is not a good thing. Companies need to be taught to be ethical. When a CEO makes 500 times higher than what a regular worker makes, it's out of control. There's too much greed. There needs to be a balance and there needs to be ethics. So democratic socialism is a more ethical way of running society. And then having capitalism as the cherry on top. Instead of what we have now in the United States, which seems to be mostly capitalism, mostly freedom for wealthy people to run things and boss us all around and hoard and embezzle the money, while the rest of us live in poverty. It seems to me that poverty is skyrocketing in the United States and our wages need to be increased. Federal minimum wage is seven twenty five an hour, which I've said before is a totally poverty wage. I made seven fifty an hour in nineteen ninety four. That was twenty three years ago. So it's horrifying to me that minimum wage federal minimum wage is so low. So rent should just be a third of someone's income. If someone makes $10,000 a month, they can afford $3,000 a month rent. But if you're like me and you make $1,500 a month, you certainly can't afford $3,000 a month just in rent. So people need to be able to pay a third of their income for rent. So I am in favor of democratic socialism. And I know that the way our system works right now, Bernie Sanders could never be the president of the United States because he is too much of a threat to the bankers and the Wall Street people and the military industrial complex. If we had actual democracy, one person, one vote, perhaps he could win. So those are my thoughts on that. So thank you for tuning in to Goddess Kring, Shannon Kring in podcast number 24. Hollow Earth Radio, Shannon Kring in Goddess Kring podcast. Seattle. Tom Petty Tom widens Petty my widens jetty. Widens my jetty. Widens my jetty. Widens Mick Jagger struts Mick in. Jagger his, dagger in. his dagger grabs me. Tori Amos. Tori Amos. Tori Amos. Doesn't blame Tori us. Tori Amos. Tori Amos. Doesn't blame us. Doesn't blame names us. But names us. Bada boo. Bada bean. Bada bean. Stinging rings the cream. Rings the cream. Catch the wind song, Catch the spiral, wind song drive. spiral drive. Crack the code. Crack the code. Drive. Left and right no. Left and right no. I wander and I wander and I wander. Tripping over tripping grasshoppers, tripping grasshoppers, moon hollers, moon hollers, key robbers, key robbers. Enchanted land, Enchanted smoky land, hands, smoky rough hands, and cracked. Rough hands, and crack. Take this sand Take this and stand, stand, alone. stand alone. And all alone. All one. All one. I present. I present. The present. The present. Desert. 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 The desert, the desert, exercise, 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 So that's some Kring speak poetry, Shannon Kring and poetry that I wrote and recorded just for you. So if you go to shannonkringa.com, click on music. You can listen to lots of free MP3s. <coughs> Feel free to download them, sample them, use them. I also offer my photography for free under the Creative Commons license. I've had it, my photos published on the Bill Moyers website. Uh, photos I took of Shawama Shawant. Shawama, how do you say her name? The socialist lady who's in the Seattle City Council. Shawama Shawant. And what else? BuzzFeed. Um, publish some of my self-portraits and I'm just really happy that some national websites actually NPR, KCTS, um, I forgot all the names but there's different websites, uh, national websites that have published some of my photos as well as local Seattle publications. So it's free if you want to publish my photos. If you need an inter interesting photo for your blog or your website or you just want a nice screensaver, you can check out my Shannon Kringen photos on Flickr. Just go to shannonkringa.com and you'll just see a bunch of my artwork. I'm always open to questions and comments. I sometimes think about interviewing people for my show, for my podcast here. Uh, but I think I'm most comfortable just doing my own solo thing. Maybe sometime though I'll have a dialogue with somebody or interview them or have them interview me. 
I want to talk more about my traveling. I, I lived in Italy for just a few weeks once in 2005. That was pretty cool. I lived in Pisa, Italy. A friend of mine invited me on this epic, amazing five-week trip to Europe. I went to Italy and France and Belgium and Lenox, Massachusetts for a naturist gathering. And it was a five-week interesting trip. And there was a heat wave, so I got really sunburned and full of mosquito bites. But I had a great time living in Italy. Saw Tori Amos in Paris and at the Zenith and in Belgium, Brussels, Belgium. I forgot the name of the theater for that one. I gave her another pair of hand-painted shoes. So I love to travel. I went to England a year and a half ago and Scotland four years before that and Santa Barbara. And I love to travel and take photos and just soak up the energy. I'm very sensitive to the way things smell and taste and feel and the air feels different. I love to go to Santa Barbara because it's like where I grew up, which is San Diego, California. There's the scent of eucalyptus. Eucalyptus sent the wind. Eucalyptus sent me back. Diego, San Diego, Diego, San Diego. I love San Diego and the eucalyptus trees that blow and you can just smell it in the air. It's very medicinal. I think it's healthy and medicinal. And I love to smell eucalyptus trees. So thank you for listening. And let's figure out how we're going to wrap up the show. If you have any suggestions of topics that you would like me to talk about, feel free. I am open to suggestions on topics. So thank you for tuning in. Shannon Kring and Goddess Kring on Hollow Earth Radio, Seattle. That's a little Kring speak for you. I call that 33 fluffy pillows. It's 33 fluffy pillows, and that's my voice backwards. My friend and I worked on that a few years ago. I like to play with my voice. I write poetry and I do spoken word and I like to add echo and play my voice backwards. I was thinking about getting a keyboard so that I can do improvisational keyboard music and add it to this podcast mix. This is Shannon Kring and Goddess Kring on Hollow Earth Radio. Thanks for tuning in. One hen, two ducks, three squawking geese, four limerick oysters, five corpulent porpoises, Six pairs of Don Alfonso's tweezers, 7,000 Macedonians in full battle array, eight brass monkeys from the ancient sacred crepes of Egypt, nine empathetic, sympathetic, diabetic old men on roller skates with a marked propensity for procrastination and sloth. That's something that my choir teacher taught us when I was 13 years old, and he told us that we had tremendous capacity in our memory, in our brains. And he had us memorize that. We spent all day long or our whole period long memorizing it and saying it as fast as we could, which reminds me of some of the acting classes I've taken where you get to repeat and memorize lines and say them over and over and over. I think it's the OCD in me that loves to just repeat things over and over. Maybe it's partly related to being musical and partly related to wanting to be repetitive There's something kind of comforting about repetition and cycles and spinning spirals, the infinite, intricate patterns of nature. So this is Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring. Follow your bliss and I'll seal it with a kiss. Thank you so much for tuning in to Goddess Kring, Shannon Kringen podcast. What is it? Number 24, March 30th, 2017 on Hollow Earth Radio. So check out ShannonKringen.com if you want to see more of my art and ask me questions and comments and share topic ideas with me. 
I enjoy recording my voice and I hope that I'm an inspiration to you in some way or that you find this entertaining. Namaste. Goddess Kring Radio. Shannon Kringen. Goddess Kring. Shannon Kringen. Goddess Kring. Golly gee, I need to fill up the end. Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring. I'll see you next week. Thanks for listening. Goddess Kring Radio. Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring. Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring.